welcome to a very unique tutorial. Today I'll be walking through the construction of this absolutely tiny HO scale Land Rover Defender. It's quite a challenging project, especially if you don't have any experience working with such small details and electronics, but if it's something you're interested in, then this tutorial will certainly give you some guidance. I purchased this kit a while ago from Tiny 4x4, along with all of the required electronics. The kit itself comes with everything you need except the nano receiver, electronic speed controller, battery and the radio transmitter. If we take a brief rundown we can see that we have the motor and reduction gear components, the front universal joints, the chassis, front axle casing and steering knuckles, rear axle casing, rims and tyres, set of shafts, set of tubes and steering arm, a gear set, and finally plugs and a switch. The receiver, speed controller and servo were purchased separately from Tiny 4x4 and the 100 mAh LiPo battery was purchased from my local hobby shop as well as the Flysky GT3C radio transmitter. You'll also need a range of tools to get the job done. Here is a selection of tools I ended up using throughout most of this project. So let's start with the front end and assemble the universal joints. It's crazy how tiny these parts are. Because these brass joints need to be bent, we'll need to anneal the brass. This will soften the brass and prevent it from cracking as we bend it. The annealing process is achieved by heating the brass until it glows a dull orange and then let it cool down. The smaller joints are then glued onto the wheel rims using super glue. You'll probably need some zip kicker as well because super glue can take a while to cure on metal parts. Using some flat tweezers, I wedge it between the yoke and carefully twist. You only want to bend the brass just enough to allow the cross piece to fit. Overbending can cause the part to break. Now the cross can be located in between the yoke and with flat tweezers the yoke can be clamped and pressed back into its original position. For the other side we first need to file the shaft halfway. So when the two shafts from each side of the steering axle press together they make a perfect circle. This is one of those steps where you need to take it very slowly. Again before we bend the yoke it's annealed to soften the brass. Once it's been heated and then bent using the tweezers, the cross piece is inserted and the yoke is pressed back to its original shape with the cross piece in place. This is repeated for both sides. The steering knuckle is also tested to make sure the wheel can rotate freely. If it catches you may need to lightly file excess brass from the steering knuckle so the rim can rotate freely. Next the worm gear is placed in the front axle casing and one of the long steel shafts is gently tapped through the gear using a small hammer. The steel shaft will need to go right through the axle casing until it protrudes out the other side by about 2mm. This is why I'm using this piece of aluminium with a small hole so the shaft can be knocked past the end of the axle casing. The steering knuckles are attached. These may also need bending, however only a very minimal amount is required so there was no need to anneal the brass. Some small teasers was enough to clamp the two brass parts together just enough so the steering knuckle could pivot easily. Before attaching the wheels I quickly test fit the gear. Now that I know it fits I can fit them into the axle casing permanently. This is really tricky but once you get one wheel shaft through and locate the gear the second wheel shaft can be worked into position. You'll need lots of patience but just take your time and it will eventually work its way into position. <laughs> 
Once the gear is centered, some super glue is used to lock it into position along with some zip kicker to speed up the curing process. Some brass wire is used for the steering linkage. It's measured so both wheels will be parallel when connected. The linkage is pressed up from the bottom with a small amount of excess poking through the inner hole of the steering knuckle. To prevent the linkage from falling out, pliers are used to deform and flatten the small amount of excess, preventing it from falling back through the hole. You may also need to bend it slightly forward so that it doesn't interfere with the axle casing. And lastly, for the front assembly, the longest tube is inserted over the drive shaft. The rear assembly is somewhat easier to build. The two smaller tubes are super glued onto each of the rims. Just like the front, the second worm gear is placed into the center and the second long drive shaft is hammered into position. As with the front axle, the shaft will need to be pushed right through and protrude about 2mm out the back of the axle casing. With the worm gear in place, the second 15 tooth gear is dropped in and one of the smaller axles is used and hammered through. Just be sure to tap gently as it's very easy to bend the brass inside the axle casing. Now the two wheels can be attached. I found no glue was needed on these parts as they were quite a tight fit. A quick test shows it's working nicely. The largest of the gears is pressed over the rear drive shaft. It gets inserted into the chassis from underneath and then the front drive assembly is also inserted. With the two drive assemblies in place, the tube can be slid forward connecting the front and back drive assemblies. Now a drop of super glue is applied to each end of the tube, locking the two assemblies together. The large 36 tooth gear is pushed forward as far as it can go without rubbing against the chassis. It too is glued into position so that it's permanently fixed. Now for the motor and reduction gear. I had to push the pinion gear down on the motor shaft so the motor wouldn't hang off the back of the chassis. The reduction gear assembly is put together and slid into position. And the motor is placed in there as well. Everything fits nice and snug. The reduction gear assembly is fixed down with super glue. Just make sure before you apply the glue that the motor pinion gear doesn't impact the largest 36 tooth gear towards the front, otherwise it will bind up and won't run. And a quick test shows that it all seems to be working quite well. And we can't forget to put on the tyres. To attach the servo, we'll need to cut away the excess wire and the plug. We also need to remove the two small screw tabs on each end. Trying to fit this servo, I found a few things were preventing a perfect fit. First, the reduction gear was poking out too far, so it was trimmed using the Dremel. Second, the notch was about 1mm too close, so it too was shaved back with the Dremel. And lastly, the top tab was too tight, so it was shaved again with the Dremel. After doing all that, I managed to get the servo to fit perfectly. The steering shaft is pressed into the servo and then placed onto the chassis. That way I can see how much excess there is. I mark where I need to cut and then remove the excess again with the Dremel. Now the steering shaft is glued into position and the servo can be permanently glued onto the chassis. The recharging plug is glued onto the side so it can be accessed from underneath and the on-off switch is also glued onto the side of the chassis as well. 
I use some super tack glue on these parts because it's not only strong, but it's a little bit flexible given that these items will be getting moved and pressed over time. I found when trying to fit the body on top there were a few problems. Firstly, the steering shaft was making contact with the front of the body, but a little sanding took care of that. Also, the motor wires were pressing against the back, so again some sanding was required. And finally, the battery I bought was a little fat and was touching the roof, so you guessed it, some sanding took care of that as well. A test fit of the body shows that it all fits just right. As for wiring, you'll want the finest wire you can get away with because there really isn't much room to spare. I'm definitely no expert on soldering and wiring in general, so instead of showing you all the ways not to solder, I'll leave you with a pictorial view of the wiring setup as it's wired on this model. You could also add all sorts of effects and LEDs, however I'm just going with a basic setup for this model, which is basically a motor and steering control. Once it's all wired, I cross my fingers and turn it on. The flashing LED indicates that it's working, so I turn it off and grab the radio transmitter. For this model, to bind the transmitter and receiver, I hold down the bind button on the transmitter while turning it on. I continue to hold down the bind button and then turn the car back on, and after a few seconds, they should be paired. The flashing red LED on the nano receiver indicates a poor or intermittent signal but I suspect it may have been due to the battery being low. Since running with a fully charged battery, I get a good signal which is indicated by a solid red LED light. Now that I know it works, I can work on the steering. The steering arm is a little longer than it needed to be, so the last two holes on the arm are trimmed away. The arm is glued hanging vertically off the steering shaft. Using the remaining brass wire, I bend the steering rod into shape as you can see here. The sides with the S bend goes into the steering arm, and the other side with the 90 degree bend goes into the outer hole on the steering knuckle. Once that's on, we can test the steering function. Now it's just a matter of using some double sided sticky tape to press the circuit boards on top of the servo and the battery above the motor. It's a tight fit but if you've minimised the amount of wiring it should be a good fit. How can I resist another test drive? The kit comes with some photo etched parts which can be bent with pliers but for the best results, I recommend using something like a photo etch parts bender. It also comes with tiny side mirrors, which I lost. A photo etch bender is pretty easy to use. Just line up the edge and use the blade to get a nice even bend. Don't forget to bend out the small side mounting plates as well. Now we can start painting. As always, a coat of primer is applied. I tend to lean towards the Tamiya Fine Surface Primer for detailed models. Just remember to apply thin, even coats to avoid running. A hairdryer works to speed up the process, but just be careful as the resin used to 3D print the body gets very soft when heated. The color scheme I'm going for is orange, gray, and black. The main body color is Vallejo Clear Orange, and while it's quite outstanding, it will be dulled down later with some weathering. To highlight the body detail like the bonnet and the door handles, I use Vallejo Panzer Dark Grey. A dark brown oil wash is applied basically over the entire shell. I used MIG Oil Brusher Dark Brown along with some of their enamel thinners. It helps to tone down the bright orange colour. The visible spots on the chassis were painted black, being very careful not to get any paint on the parts that need to move. 
Additional weathering is done with some mud browns and dark earth weathering powder. Unfortunately the footage was lost but here you can see the final effect. The openings for the lights have a small drop of crystal clear applied to act as the glass light coverings. It will dry completely clear and glossy. Now all the extra detail can be added like the roof rack, the front bull bar and also the side mirrors. Given that I lost the supplied mirrors I had some replacement Land Rover mirrors from a Bush Land Rover model that I was able to use. I think they actually look quite good. To keep the model running smoothly I lubricate the gears with some model train lubricant. It will only need the smallest of drops on each of the gears but you'll notice it runs much nicer once the gears have been oiled. And lastly we need to know how to charge the model. I'm using a pretty standard hobby charger from JCAR. Just make sure your charger is capable of charging a single cell LiPo and can charge at 100 milliamp hours. Once you've selected those settings you can start charging. And now we have a completed model. It's definitely not for the faint hearted building a project like this but it was certainly a lot of fun and the enjoyment afterwards is definitely worth it. If you too decide to take on a challenge like this hopefully you'll find this tutorial helpful. It's so much fun driving this thing around and even better when you get some scenery to drive through. It did a good job of driving through this acoustic foam and I managed to navigate up a 37 degree incline. But maybe try and avoid rolling onto the roof. Cheers and thanks for watching. Oh my god. Did you just you just ran into that sign and you it's broken. Just, oh watch out for the tree. Oh my oh god. Mate, just drop me off at the next.